for coming. I would like to use the first 30 seconds of my precious 18 minutes um, to really thank the RCC for having me here. As you mentioned, I'm in the transition between two book projects, one of which I finished here in the uh, in my time as a Rachel Carson Fellow, and I wouldn't have had I been in the hustle and bustle of the regular work at the university. And now I'm starting this new project. I have been thinking about it a lot, but I feel that now in the remaining six weeks of my RCC time, um, I will really get it started. And I really, really um, enjoyed very much the input from the other fellows. So thank you, everybody in the Rachel Carson Center, for having Having me here. Um, yeah, you said it's kind of an unlikely take. I will be a cultural uh, historian or a humanities scholar to deal with a topic such as climate. But let me start. Yeah, this is the table of contents of my talk. I don't know how I'm going to pull through in like the remaining 17 minutes. Uh, I will start, however, with the usual scientific definition of climate, because that's my point of departure to, to think about what is missing here. Climate in a narrow sense is usually defined as the average weather, or more rigorously, as the statistical description in terms of the mean and variability of relevant quantities over a period of time ranging from months to thousands or millions of years. The classical period is 30 years, and then it goes on and on. That's just um, one of the appendices of uh, one of the um, IPCC uh, assessment reports. It is basically a very classical definition, um, climate as the average weather. Um, however, this definition is not eternal. It's about 150 years old. I will not get into this, the history of this definition. I would like to talk about what is missing from this scientific take on climate. It's a planetary take that is not dealing with locations, with events, singularities, specific um, uh, emergences of the weather, uh, but it's dealing with global averages. So it's something that you cannot experience. Um, thereby, it externalizes climate as an object out there. Um, one um, phrase I found very telling about that is of the, the late Wally Brucker, who is one of the most important climatologists of, of our recent times. And he said, the climate is an angry beast and we're poking it with sticks, meaning that the climate is something external to us. However, I would say, no, no, we're stuck inside of that beast and we need to understand it from the inside. What we have also in this definition are scaling problems. We experience um, climate in a certain range of time or in a certain location. However, climate is today defined as a planetary system which does not really take into account the local unless as an element, as a subcategory of the planetary. Um, we also have different scales of time. This, of course, is a big issue with discussing the Anthropocene. We have, on the one hand, the deep time of planetary history, and on the other hand, the human time of our experiences of the way we write history from the French Revolution to today, and so on and so forth. Um, the Scientific definition of climate also tends to call for what I call technofixes. With this externalized approach, we tend to think about climate as something that we have to deal with technically uh, in its most extreme forms as uh, climate engineering, in a more local way as air conditioning, and so on. I will get back to that later. So my approach would be to understand climate, um, to view it from the inside and also to view it historically. Um, Mike Hume, whom I met I think 
four or five years ago at the Rachel Carson Center when there was a conference on climate in Munich, um, has written a wonderful book and he tries to promote this approach, a cultural approach to climate. Making sense of climate and its changes cannot be separated from how weather enwraps itself with landscapes, memory, the body, the imagination and routine practices in particular places. Approaching climate this way demands an explicitly geographical and cultural interrogation of how people live climatically, how they become weathered. That's the title of his book, Weathered. I would say we need to add one more theoretical category to understand what climate or air is. Um, that would be the notion of medium. Um, I refer to John Durham Peters who has written a theory of elemental media. Um, to, just to give you a definition, elemental media are vessels and environments, containers of possibilities that anchor our existence and make what we are doing possible. So thinking about climate or air as I like to call it for historical reasons because the notion of climate has changed enormously. So in a certain way I like to talk about air as a kind of umbrella term um, covering what used to be called climate, what today is called climate, um, what refers to the quality of air, um, the impact on bodies and so on. But generally speaking of air as a medium means understanding it both as a mediator between different entities in our existence I will get to that, what that really means, and also as a condition of possibility, as Kant would have it. So in which way does air or climate enable our lives, and not just in a biological sense or in the sense of breathing, but also our social lives? And this is what you may find a little bizarre. Um, how does climate impact culture. What I want to do is take a historian's view on that. So I take a historical uh, shallow time perspective going back to European antiquity more or less, thinking about climate there, 18th century, and then looking at how climate was what I called turned into the, or meteorologized into the, turned into average weather only in the 19th, in the second half of the 19th century. So let's go to a few of the functions. I, I would say four or five functions. The first is dwelling in air. What I have here is a quote from Montesquieu's uh, The Spirit of the Laws from 1742, um, which contains a chapter on the relation between social systems and climates. I will not read this paragraph to you. It's kind of a dummy or a symbol for what I'm getting at, starting with Hippocrates and antique theory of the relation between climate, how does climate not just Im impact bodies, but really forms bodies and thereby forms also forms the social systems that are dwelling in a given location. That would be a first function of climate. Um, Montesquieu's point in a certain way, when you read this quote, uh, cold air transforms the body in such a way that it also uh, transforms the character and thereby the social system in which these people live or which these people build for themselves, you will find this pretty deterministic. I am looking at this in a different way. What is What Montesquieu, Hippocrates, John Arbuthnot and all are asking is, what is the relation between a given location, the bodies of the humans that live in that location, their minds and the way they engage in specific social relations. So it's a relational term and I'm looking at the way this relation is coined. The second function would be floating in the air. A climate as a system of, as Aristotle puts it, emanations, events, um, of flows, 
dynamics. What I have here also rather as a dummy than um, in order to talk about it in depth is Halley's uh, uh, system. These little dots that you see are in fact arrows. It's just the bad quality. <laughs> it's the trade winds. It's the discovery of the trade winds as the first step of, in order to look at climate as a system of flows encompassing the entire planet, which also, without the trade winds, I mean, or the discovery of the trade winds is of eminent importance for the development of yeah, a certain specific type of uh, a colonialism, uh, the, the, the colonial exchange as uh, people had it. Um, so the question here is, to look at climate as the condition of these, you know, travelings around the the trans the the modes of transportation around the world, but it also deals with ephemeral um, theories about clouds, for instance, the classification of clouds that uh, comes out early in the 19th century, which is of enormous importance for the history of art, but also for poets such as uh, Johann Wolfgang Goethe. Um, with this uh, approach on air, we also see the, the foundations of what I call the meteorolo meteorologization. It's not a word that exists in English, not even in German. Um, seeing climate as the all-encompassing system of weather and thereby trying to create averages in order to measure climate. This happens with people like uh, the Austrian meteorologist Julius von Hahn who defined for the first time in 1883. So you see how young this is defined weather as the um, climate as the as average weather. So a third point would be the temporality of climate. Thinking about climate as a, um, a, a pacemaker, a temporal um, device, um, such as in the seasons. Um, let me just give you a, an example. This is Nicolas Poussin's uh, uh, The Four Seasons. You see four seasons here. The first is the spring. Um, what you see are scenes from the Bible, but also you see cert the, the, the light is a certain time of the day. Uh, so this is the morning. It's Adam and Eve in the garden. So you see um, the second, you see the summer, um, which is a scene uh, with uh, Ruth and Boaz. Um, it's the summer. It's the time of harvest and plenitude, it's bright daylight. You have the fall, it's kind of an afternoon type of warm yellowish light. You see the, the harvesting of the grapes. And then you see um, the deluge. Um, you say that, deluge? Yeah, no, not really, deluge. Okay. Um, so what I want to show is uh, show you is a take on climate as a cyclic pattern, but it's a cycle that is not just a natural cycle, but it's also cultural and historical. It, these, the series of these poems it, it, it encompasses four or five different modes of time, just biblical time, prehistory with a deluge image. You, you would go back to, you know, geological um, transformations which are starting to be um, researched at the beginning of the uh, at the end of the uh, the 17th century but mostly in the 18th century so um, climate in this case would be um, uh, in many different forms of temporality would be a way in which humans relate to time scales that are accessible but also inaccessible to them, like the deep time of geological transformation. When you look at one of the earliest books of geology, um, uh, Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, you see that geology, geological or change is actually climate change, but in very, very long time scales. Uh, so I'm looking at this material too. To give you a first summary, but I'm not done and I hope I have a few minutes left. Okay, good. Um, I would see um, 
air or climate as a mediator. Um, and that's how it's being addressed in many different ways in the cultural history of the Occident um, as a mediator between bodies and cultures and their natural environments. And you can tell, for, for instance, why Montesquieu is so interesting because he tries to come up with a theory of laws, of laws are a thing of human making, but tries to found this in nat the natural, you know, environmental um, uh, givens that a culture is situated in. Um, it, it is also a medi mediator between localities and the planet. When you think of the trade winds, when you think of this function of floating um, or of transportation, you would say air or climate is what transports something from one point uh, on, on the planet all over the planet, and we can track this. And there's a lot of research, of course, being done now, but there's also, interestingly enough, a lot of artwork that is dealing, like Thomas Saraceno's um, Aerocene work. It's also a mediator between human history and planetary history and the different scales of time, as you could see in the Poussin paintings. And of course, and it's very specifically when you think of this term Anthropocene and talking about humans as a geological force, of course, between the individual practices of every single uh, living uh, being or, or specific lifestyles and it's something that we would call global change or planetary change. So let me give you, this is a very contemporary take on climate. It's, a, it's from a handbook on Earth system sciences. You see the different geospheres like uh, the hydrosphere, the water, the atmosphere, which is my topic, but also uh, the lithos and pedospheres. And the, what you see is that this system of flows is actually what's binding everything together. It's the atmosphere and the flows in the water. So we're very well put together, Jenny and I. Water, it's about flows, right? Okay. Now my last um, chapter or topic will actually deal with climate change, but in a different way than you may think of it. Um, it's about constructing climates and affecting climates. So that encompasses experiments like the Biosphere 2 uh, in Arizona, where they really tried to build a closed system of life parallel to Biosphere 1, which would be you know, our general planetary environment through uh, all the, the technologies of air conditioning, which has a long history going down to the glass houses or greenhouses of the 18th, 19th century, um, or something like uh, the Crystal Palace in the 19th century, which is basically an enclosed marketplace where you would say like that's where you go shopping but now all of a sudden it's indoors and under uh, controlled conditions. Um, up to planetary climate engineering. That would be um, the last chapter. So I think writing such a cultural history of climate really um, has to, in a certain way, take a step back from this immediate urgency of climate change that you mentioned in your presentation of my work, a step back and then eventually return to climate change in order to understand it differently. Understanding air as a medium means also understanding the, the alterations of the air in local confined conditions as well as on a planetary scale um, in a different way and as I would point, say, from the inside, uh, as being involved in it, um, uh, but also being deeply affected in it and not just by, you know, changing weather patterns or something. So, um, what climate change means, if you understand air as a medium, means a disruption um, that is making the medium perceptible in a certain way. That might be a Heideggerian idea of disrupting a medium in order to understand it, in order to make it more explicit. Um, but I think that's how we should understand climate change in a certain way. The Anthropocene or climate change as a 
huge planetary experiment, that, but we're stuck in it, not in a, in a classical modern sense where we do it in the lab and the, the experiment is happening and we can take a step aside. So it, it, is, it also urges us to better understand the medium. Um, it also raises a couple of very profound and complicated epistemic problems such as a deframing of scales or a, um, collision of scales as Deepesh Chakrabarty uh, calls it. Having planetary history, the long scales of planetary history collide with the very, very short scales of human um, lives and cultures, most specifically in what the Anthropocene call, uh, discourse calls the Great Acceleration. We are currently in a time where everything is accelerating and, and what we would call human time frames is shortening more and more and there's more and more change crammed into ever shortening uh, periods of time. Um, and eventually understand this transformation from within, meaning also, under, if I emphasize the word understanding, I really mean it in an in a old-fashioned hermeneutical, humanities-infused way, understand the cultural significance, but also the phenomenological or even aesthetical impact to feel through climate change or to understand in which way it will affect or has affected cultures and how cultures have been thinking about that, not just since 2005, but basically since antiquity. Thank you very much.